Happy Easter. Easter. Christ is risen. risen Amen. We're grateful to be gathered here on this beautiful Easter morning to gather our hearts in worship and to open our lives to Christ's love and to know that love is the winner this day. Not hate, not death, not all the things that scare us, but God's love. And so today, uh, speaking of love, our gratitude moment is giving thanks for the love between two people that have lasted 60 years, uh, Don and Corinne Iwanaki. And so I thought it was an appropriate connection for us to think about love and an expansive life. And according to Don, he told me the, 50, the first 50 years are the hardest. So. <laughs> So today we celebrate this expansive gift of life. Uh, we've been going through this whole theme of, of uh, grace and how to open our lives to God's grace. We've been looking at stories of amazing love. And today it's kind of the ultimate story of amazing love and expansive love and expansive life. And thinking of uh, the women that went to the tomb they were looking for someone to, uh, who's buried to help take care of his body. And so we think of Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women that went with their spices. But they were stunned. He wasn't there. And there, there were two angels that told them, uh, he's not here. Why are you looking for uh, the living among the dead? But this story 
changed everything for them. Even though they were scared, they didn't understand it right away. You can only imagine it from your own experiences when God does something amazing in your life. It's not always easy to see it right away. It takes a little bit of time. You reflect and you're like, oh, that's what God was doing in my life. And so that's what was happening for these women. And then they went out and told the others, even though they themselves couldn't really figure it out fully. But the others scoffed at them and said, these women are telling us idle tales. The only one that really went and believed this was Peter. He went into the tomb and he wanted to look. And this is according to the Gospel of Luke for us today. And so today I want to open us with uh, a poem, New Life is Right Here. And this is by Reverend S Sarah R. Speed, who uh, presents the story from the perspective of our lives today too. Maybe today we can take a moment. Maybe today we can silence the inner critic Maybe today we can leave perfection at the door. Maybe today we can allow ourselves to be here. Maybe that's all that matters. Maybe the sunrise is for us. Maybe these hallelujahs are for us. Maybe the hope blooming in my chest is for us. Maybe the resurrection was not just about God's body, but it is about our, our body. Maybe this new life reaches all the way to the edges. Maybe we are free to live in a new way where love is the currency and we are enough. Maybe that's what this is all about, not a relentless pursuit of more, but God's relentless pursuit of me. New life is right here, like the women, say it out loud, like Peter, run that way, amen. I'm going to invite us to pray, uh, invite you to take a deep breath and open your heart to God's presence in this moment and God's grace. Holy God, we so often long for more. We want more than the hamster wheel life of to-do lists and errands, meal prep and alarm clocks. We want more than comparison and competition. We want more than certainty that drowns out curiosity. We want more than fear that leads to violence. We want a life that is teeming with alleluias. We want a life overcrowded with hope. We want a life congested with good news. We want a life jam-packed with forgiveness. We want a life bursting with laughter. We want a life so full that the stone just has to be rolled away. So today, O oh God, we pray, break the dam, dust the cobwebs from our ears clear space in our minds to hear you clearly. Speak to us as only you can. It's what we long for. We long for you. Break into our hearts, overflow here. We pray this gratefully in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Today is a day of music and celebration and thinking about exciting things and, and a new life. But today is also recognizing the brokenness of humanity and some of the challenges that we face. And so I begin with a little bit of a downer, uh, but I think it, it speaks to some of the struggles that we all face. Uh, I'm reviewing a book for the library called The Last uh, Slave Ship. I'm um, doing this, by the way, with uh, Reverend Sheila uh, Campbell. And so uh, it's been really an interesting read. Uh, it's, it's a story of the only slave ship uh, that was found. And so was, I, I felt really bad, like this happened uh, in 2018, and I didn't find out until now, um, you know, until I uh, got to read this book. But there, there is a part of the story that really spoke to me in relationship to this uh, Easter story for us. There is a part where this captain goes and uh, he took, in order to buy the slaves from Benin, when he would get to Africa and they, they left from Mobile, Alabama, uh, he took 27 pounds of gold with him. That's how they uh, bought human beings. And so the writer, uh, Ben Raines, says the currency of the realm in slave transactions. And so it was interesting he hid it because the crew, which was really an interesting part of the story as well, the crew he hired, they did not know that their mission was to uh, get human beings to, to trade slaves because this was illegal at that time. This is the year was 1859. So this was after, and you can imagine this is close to the Civil War, uh, but this was a challenge that they would defy the federal government and they would still be able to go and get uh, human beings. So interesting enough that he hid it under the bulkhead and uh, so the rest of the crew wouldn't know what was going on. And so they started the journey and as they started going, you know, everything looked good but somehow the ship was off course. Uh, and he was puzzled, like, what was going on? The compass was working, everything was working, everything was charted perfectly. And then at night, he remembered. It was the gold. 27 pounds is a lot of gold, certainly enough to affect the magnetic field around it. So he needed to move, and that's exactly what he did. He moved, uh, he moved the gold because it was uh, steering the ship uh, away from its course. And I thought this is a, I read this symbolically. I read this symbolically thinking about how gold and those things that attract us uh, can steer us off the course of love in life. Uh, that gold was going to be used to purchase human beings. And interesting enough, of course, that a lot of the slave traders considered themselves to be good Christians. Think about that, and they didn't see the irony of, of that, following the way of Jesus, following the way of love, and still doing horrendous things to other human beings. And so I thought of this symbolically for us, how we find, we find the gold of life, whatever that is my, for you, it could be any, anything. It doesn't have to be material wealth. Sometimes we hang on to things that hurt others or hurt us, because we believe that they are the true uh, happiness in life. And so, blinded by greed, thinking about these people, they lost their inner guidance. And the same thing happens for us. The same thing happens for us. When we don't center our lives on love, when we don't allow this expansive life to be the way of everyday life, we lose our way, we find ourselves off course. And I believe that's what happened to a lot of the people who heard about the witness of the resurrection. It only happened for the people who were centered on love, it only happened for the people who were able to see Jesus for who he was, just like his birth. It was humble and a lot of people didn't know it was happening. The same was true for the resurrection. Imagine that, you know, we, we often think, you know, if we saw the resurrection, would we believe, we say? Maybe, maybe, it's not a given. 
It's not, it's, not a, it's not an event, it wasn't an event that, you know, there were fireworks in the sky and Jesus was on television and was alive and everybody was touching him and everything was fine. It wasn't that kind of event. It was an inner experience, an inner experience of the power of love living on. Only those who had the eyes to see were able to see. The rest missed the whole thing. And not only that, they denied it. They scoffed at it. Some even said it was an idle tale. So today we're going to visit the story, and I uh, invite you. We're going to do. A, a, we'll, we'll watch a video with, which gives us a summary of the whole story, and then we'll read the scripture from Luke 24. We've been looking at the story of Jesus as it's told in Luke's Gospel. It begins with the arrival of an unlikely king born in poor, humble circumstances. Then we saw Jesus as a teacher, a prophet. He went throughout Israel calling people to a radical way of life, where enemies become friends, the poor are cared for, where people find forgiveness for their failures. He went from town to town inviting people to follow him and live under God's reign in this upside down way. And he did many signs and wonders. So many Israelites began to hope that he would rescue Israel from the Romans and set up a new kingdom of peace and justice. In short, that he would bring the kingdom of God. Now the religious leaders of the day were also hoping for God's kingdom. But to them, the message of Jesus was a threat. Yeah, they had expected to gain power and prestige when this all went down. But Jesus said God's kingdom belongs to the poor, to the outsider, and that real power is serving others in love. This conflict intensified when Jesus, while in Jerusalem, disrupted the temple sacrifices and called Israel's leaders a gang of rebels. So they arrested Jesus, and they had him accused before the Roman authorities of being a rebel king. He was handed over for execution, even though he was innocent. Then he was taken outside the city and put to death on false charges. This brings us to the final section of the Gospel of Luke. There was a religious leader named Joseph who opposed Jesus' execution and then requested to be given his body so he could bury Jesus in a nearby tomb. And then a couple of days later, some women who had followed Jesus came to visit that tomb and they found it open and empty. And they encountered these mysterious figures telling them Jesus was alive from the dead. So they run away terrified. Nobody believes their report. I mean, he can't be alive. They all saw him die. Now, just that. All right. So we'll listen to Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returned from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The accusation of something like this is idle tales. These are women telling these stories. Women's witness was not counted for much. It was seen as an idle tale. Women didn't have the credibility the, to witness, to tell such a story. But I think it's very interesting and very powerful that those who were able to see the resurrection were the women, those who were on the fringes. They weren't the people in power. You see, the gold, think of that metaphor of the gold. 
weighing you down, making you steer away from the right course of life. You don't see things clearly because the compass is messed up. The compass is messed up. And these women, they had it in them because they'd been watching Jesus. They'd been funding Jesus' ministry. They'd been with him. They were working. They gave it all for his ministry. Their love was complete. And so was the witness of the resurrection to them. And so think about those on the fringes and, and how they're not weighed down by the gold of life. They know better. They know that life is hard. They know that our only hope in life is to focus on love. And sometimes it takes a lifetime for people to learn that lesson. Think about it for us. Sometimes it takes until the time of death you realize, oh, oh, that's what it's about? That's what this whole thing is all about? It's about love. And so today, for us, Easter is about God's grace entering into our lives and surprising us by shifting our focus to love instead of the gold of life. Think of that image for you. What is the gold that, that steers you off course? What is it that lures you to believe, you know, that busyness or good looks or accomplishments or whatever it is that's going to give you that happiness that, you know, often end up making us live diminished lives. And so thinking of all the worry, uh, we had um, Thursday evening for the Monday, Thursday service here, we had uh, an experience of inviting people to uh, write on their a piece of paper and put it in a baptismal bowl to uh, re to let go of whatever holds us back. And I didn't read them because we ended up getting them wet. I promised people we won't read them because I wanted people to be honest and, and open up to God. It wasn't the invitation to you know to come and and uh, air out all your problems. But the invitation was to let go of that that is holding us, or whatever is holding us back. And I have a feeling, I didn't read it as I said, but I know, I know for a fact, worry probably was number one. Because <laughs> I know, I've been, I've been a pastor for a while now, and I know from my years of experience, that's number one, worry. We, how many of you have trouble sleeping at night? Okay, confession time, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or sometimes, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night, uh, and the last few weeks, it, it's been really rough. Mike can witness to that, because I get calls at 12.30, sometimes at 3 o'clock from California, from my brother. And I'm worried, you know, thinking, you know, I, how, do I, how do I not? And I want to turn the phone off. But then there's the side of me that wants to, to hear if there's something that goes on. So worry, I know worry. Sometimes a sense of loss. Sometimes it's that sense of needing to prove ourselves for others. Uh, like, you know, you're just not good enough. And the list goes on. I mean, we could go on and on about life and all of its struggles. But the whole point of this story is for us to proclaim a different vision to live by a different vision. And so there's a, a quote for you from Peter Gomes in a book called What We Forgot to Tell You. He says, the evidence of Easter is a reconfigured Easter people, people who are no longer afraid of the dark, people who dare to live by their, by their affections and not by their fears, people who know that they need not die in order to truly experience resurrection living. People who fear neither death nor life. In short, people such as you and me who aspire to be people like that. We are the Easter people, for death in all of its cynical, calculating, greedy ways no longer has control over us. We have a better idea. We claim a greater truth. We live because we are loved, and because we are loved, we can live. This is the invitation today for you, to remember you are loved. Christ expands our concepts of life, and that's what happened for the disciples. They were able to do amazing work. Think about it. There were a handful of people that followed him, but they changed the world because their love was so powerful. 
And speaking of that, uh, I want to end with a story, a part of a story. This is The Velveteen Rabbit. I know how many of you have not read it. <laughs> if you haven't, it's a great story uh, to tell, but it's, it's that whole invitation to become real. Becoming real is, is the key, but it's all connected to love. And so this is the conversation between the horse and uh, the Velveteen Rabbit. What is real, asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you. Then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you're, you get loose in the joints, and very shabby. That's us. <laughs> but these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. So friends, open your heart today. Let that story of the resurrection become real in your life. Focus on love. Open to this mystery that is inviting us to an expansive life. Amen. beaten, all darkness was slain, all his passion poured out like rain upon the earth. Three days buried, they came to rolled away the veil was torn for he had risen he is the king of all the
for the blessing, my friends. As you go and leave this place, may you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all of your living and breathing and being, may you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit and may it change your life. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go in peace, full to the brim. Amen. Christ is risen. Amen. You guys caught me off guard with that back and forth. I didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one for you. Please know. <laughs>